from the station working for you. This is WRTV News at 11, streaming now. This time tomorrow, there will be a new president of the United States. Thank you for joining us. I'm Amanda Starantino. And I'm Mark Mullen. Sadly, the attack on the U.S. Capitol and the COVID crisis are casting a shadow of what over what is usually a big celebration. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze has the latest on what's being done to make sure the inauguration day is safe. Amazing grace. Just hours before he takes the oath of office, President-elect Joe Biden pausing to honor the more than 400,000 American lives lost to COVID-19. To heal, we must remember the president-elect emotional before departing his beloved home state of Delaware, mourning the absence of his late son, Beau. Ladies and gentlemen, I only have one regret. He's not here. Biden arriving in a Washington unrecognizable from past inaugurations. Instead of crowds, 200,000 flags lining the National Mall, while 25,000 National Guard members patrol the streets. Amid concerns of threats from inside their ranks, at least a dozen Guard members have been removed from the mission. Two sent home after vetting revealed links to extremist groups. Any reason uh, that somebody's name is brought to the attention of the command, they're being removed from the line. In a farewell video, President Trump defiantly defended his record and wished Biden well without saying his name. This week we inaugurate a new administration and pray for its success in keeping America safe and prosperous. Trump will not attend Biden's inauguration, becoming the first president not to do so in 150 years. And Trump is well aware that he may have to defend himself at his impeachment trial in the Senate. Mitch McConnell, soon to be Senate minority leader, giving his strongest condemnation of the president yet. The mob was fed lies. They were provoked by the president and other powerful people. And sources tell ABC News President-elect Biden will give a message of unity in his inaugural address. It's a theme that will start tomorrow morning when he attends church with congressional leaders from both parties. Elizabeth Schulze, ABC News, the Capitol. Mike Pence's first trip as former vice president will be back home to Indiana. The Indiana Republican Party says Pence and his wife will travel to Columbus tomorrow afternoon to thank friends and supporters. The elders of an Indianapolis church say they've been called to send a message condemning the domestic terror attack two weeks ago on the U.S. Capitol building after seeing some of the rioters invoking symbols of Christianity during their siege. Tonight, WRTV's Cornelius Hawker shows you why a leader at Common Ground Christian Church Midtown was moved to speak out. Jesus didn't turn a blind eye to um, injustice. We just feel called to do the same. That's one of the major reasons why Common Ground Church Midtown put out this statement in the wake of the domestic terror attack on the U.S. Capitol building. This moment right here, widely seen by millions of people, rioters after ransacking the Senate chambers, coming together to pray. And in other videos from that day, Christian symbols being worn or carried. Elder Claire White had something to say about all of it. When we heard and saw people using symbols that were consistent with Christianity, it, it stirred in us something that felt uh, not Jesus-like. The church's statement read in part, we lament that men and women portrayed a violent version of Christianity that is not congruent with the teachings of Jesus. Going on to say, they lament that so many people who claim to follow Christ have instead put their trust in human leaders for their salvation. Claire tells me the church held a prayer service over the attack on the Capitol. Rather than, than prayer um, being the end of what we do, it, it's almost like it's the beginning. It's, it's our way of... Uh, trying to discern best what it is that God's calling us to do so that we can then act out in um, in whatever ways seem most appropriate and honoring to him. And for this moment, that means reclaiming the Christianity they know by doing good in our community. Sharing resources and developing relationships uh, with the neighborhood, community center, and public school, and just getting to know some of the folks in that in that space. Um, just because we... we take very seriously that call to to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Are you guys hoping to set an example uh, for other churches, for other people in the Christian faith? Or, you know, or, or are you just leading by example, hoping other people, you know, follow you? Yeah, that's, 
It would be great if if we all did this together. I don't know that our intention is to lead the way. It's it's more just a response to what we really believe God is calling us to do. Working for you, Cornelius Hawker, WRTV. Elder White says this statement is just the beginning of the church's plans to address problems in our community. She tells WRTV that they've reached received rather overwhelming support and gratitude for releasing that statement. You can read it in its entirety in this story on our app or on WRTV.com. Governor Eric Holcomb praised Indiana's resiliency and foundation in his state of the state address tonight, and he has high hopes for the new year. Ladies and gentlemen, coming off at 2020, I'm convinced 2021 can be the best ever. So the central question before us all is how can we seize this day? Thankfully, in Indiana, our capabilities will be aided by our momentum, for sure. But we must not slow down. In fact, we must accelerate and go, go, go. Governor Holcomb says that starts with focusing on the health and wealth of Hoosiers. He discussed improving the state's infant mortality rate and the COVID-19 vaccination plan. When it comes to the job market, he talked about state programs that help provide education and training. The workforce ready and employer grant programs we put in place are making a huge difference for Hoosiers moving more of them into higher paying jobs and increasing the number of people achieving a post-secondary education. We've strategically put an emphasis on increasing minority participation in these programs, and we're seeing positive results. Lives are being transformed. It's working, and we need to do more of it. For a more in-depth review of the state of the state as well as reaction, go to the WRTV app or WRTV.com. COVID-19 is now responsible for more than 9,000 deaths in Indiana. WRTV is dedicated to remembering those lives lost, sharing their faces, names, and stories. Tonight, the Indiana Democratic Party hosted a virtual memorial honoring Hoosiers who have died from the virus. Give us, we pray now, comfort, in our anxieties and our fears, courage and strength in our suffering, patience and compassion in our caring, and consolation in our grieving. The memorial featured a special guest, Sammy Logan, the 2020 North Central High School graduate, is the daughter of Paul Logan. The longtime North Central Athletic Director died of COVID-19 in April. I still have days where I want to call him or tell him something or even ask a question. He was my go-to person. I have times where I come home from college and all I want to do is drive to his office and see him, but I can't. Honoring my father this evening and all those who have lost their lives to COVID is a meaningful remembrance to them, their families, and the fight they endured. I know my dad and each of our loved ones will never be forgotten as we carry them in our hearts forever. If you lost a loved one to COVID-19 and would like to share their story, contact us at facesofcovid at wrtv.com. Our WRTV Investigates team has uncovered the VA Medical Center in Indianapolis is among several across the country that reported a critical shortage of nurses. Along with our partners at Newsy, WRTV Investigates found more and more nurses are getting sick with coronavirus or they are in quarantine at hospitals that serve military veterans. The Richard Rodebush VA Medical Center provides inpatient and outpatient services to thousands of Indiana veterans every year. The Indianapolis Hospital is one of six VA medical centers in Midwest cities, including Cleveland and Detroit, described in a federal contracting document in December as facing a critical shortage of nurses, saying, quote, due to RNs becoming infected with COVID-19, as well as requirements to self-quarantine due to confirmed or probable exposure, end quote. Detroit VA nurse Yvonne Evans worries there soon may not be enough nurses to work alongside her as infections increase. The surge hasn't quite hit yet. After this holiday, I honestly believe these surges are going to really increase. 
WRTV investigates reached out to the Indianapolis VA. A spokesperson told us the document is a routine request to hire contract nurses on a temporary basis. The VA has hired 72,000 new VA health care workers since late March. The VA also told WRTV its employee infection rate is less than 1%, lower than the 6% in all health care systems, as reported by the CDC. When we asked how this is impacting patients who are Indiana veterans, we were told that there is no impact and that all VA medical centers have adequate capacity to meet current demand. Now to what one local school district calls an encouraging trend when it comes to safely keeping kids safe in the classroom during the pandemic. Leaders with Muncie Community Schools say they're seeing an increase in the number of people interested in becoming substitute teachers. They say having talented and trained subs will help the district continue to provide an in-person learning option for students. Substitutes must pass a background check drug screen and have a high school diploma. Pay at MCS ranges from 70 to $100 per day. Subs are critical to be able to operate schools and now more so than ever. We have teachers that are either um, quarantined because of being positive or being close contacts and the amount of time they're out of classrooms is longer than what it's been in the past. So we find a greater need for subs than we've ever had before. If you're interested in learning more or becoming to uh, or applying to become a substitute teacher, we do have a link on our website at HiringHoosiers.com. Indiana State Police is hiring Hoosiers. The agency is looking to fill the 81st Recruit Academy class. ISP Sergeant Michael Wood tells WRTV the department is looking for a diverse group of people dedicated to serving communities in and outside of Indianapolis. He says class sizes are usually between 50 to 60 people. Sergeant Wood has been on the force for 14 years. Ultimately, being a trooper gives you a lot of freedom to work the road and choose what you're doing every day. Every day is different. And, uh, and with those, it brings a, a slight burden because you serve the public for what they need. But it's a very rewarding career. The deadline to apply is Sunday. You can also find more info about the opportunities with ISP at HiringHoosiers.com. New and next, why the owner of a new Indianapolis hotel says the business is good news for the whole city. Kevin. And snow showers mark from Anderson to Marion. That's where they are now. What you'll wake up to tomorrow morning and a look into the weekend. Coming up. I'm very, very, very extremely blessed uh, to be playing for such a great organization. You know, a great city, a basketball city. Ahead in sports, the newest Indiana Pacer shares his thoughts on his new team and the medical discovery that is sidelining him for now. 1,000 bonus earnings. Visitors have a new hotel option near Indianapolis International Airport. Today, city and business leaders cut the ribbon on Town Place Suites near I-70 and Ameriplex Parkway just outside of the airport. The pandemic has greatly impacted the hotel industry. Jim Dora, the president and CEO of General Hotels Corporation, says this opening is reason to celebrate. With the pandemic going on and all the things that uh, that everybody struggles with in Indianapolis, you know this is a bit of good news. We're you know we've hired people. Um, we're going to have people put to work you know that we didn't have working before. Uh, we've we're going to add to the tax base of the city, which is important all the way around. The new hotel includes 89 guest rooms and a meeting room. Now over to Kevin for your storm team forecast. And mark some snow showers around now, but as you drift off to sleep, those will zip into the Buckeye State and out of Indiana. 33, that's temperature in Kokomo. Let me just mention this. Today's the date uh, of the anniversary of our all-time coldest temperature in Indianapolis at 27 below. That goes back to 1994. As far as the snow showers, they're fast moving, maybe a dusting, that's really it. The wind is more prolonged as we go through the overnight hours. There is the snow shower activity zipping to the east, southeast, Muncie, Hartford City, Winchester, Portland. You'll still have additional snow showers. The wind gusting close to 30 miles per hour through about 5 a.m. They'll calm down a little bit through the day tomorrow, but tomorrow will feel quite cold because temperatures struggle into the lower 30s with a cold west wind. 
Overnight, snow showers zip right out of the state. We're breaking up the cloud cover as well. 21 in Lafayette, 20 tomorrow morning in Peru. Temperature starts at 22 in Indy. We only jump 10 degrees. Why does Thursday stick out in the seven-day forecast? Because it's warmer, 42 degrees, but it's sandwiched between two cold days. We're briefly warmer. That's pulled right out from under us. And then we end the work week with a 31-degree day. I just want to show you how tomorrow we let this roll out and then go through Thursday and uh, into Friday. Notice no weather system is really going to influence the Hoosier State, and that's why we're starting a dry stretch that will last until probably Sunday night. There are your modest high temperatures below average for this time of year tomorrow, but comes with sunshine. Temperatures from north to south struggling to get to 30 in Peru and Muncie, Richmond, 35 or so in Terre Haute. The wind tomorrow night picks up again and it comes out of the southwest. That's why our temperatures will be briefly warmer on Thursday. That goes with partly sunny and dry conditions. Friday much colder and that's where we'll stay Saturday as well. Sunday night, later Sunday night into Monday, a rain-snow mix becomes more likely. Temperatures will rebound to 41 early next week. Amanda. Thank you, Kevin. We showed you at the top of the hour extreme safety measures are in place in Washington, D.C. for the inauguration tomorrow. But behind the soldiers and security are homeowners, small business owners, and families. Scripps reporter Maya Rodriguez shows there is more to the nation's capital than the potential threats it's facing. In the nation's capital, it's a quadrennial event prepared for like clockwork every four years. But this time looks unlike any presidential inauguration before. On the streets here, more than 26,000 members of the National Guard from states across the Union, like Nebraska Air National Guard Captain Michael Zimmer. And I think military members, especially in this situation, whether they agree, disagree, we are there as a sign of peace to make sure things happen appropriately, uh, legally, and, and based on the Constitution. For Washington, D.C. itself, the beefed-up security welcomed after a deadly riot at the Capitol, a gratitude personally expressed to National Guard members by the city's mayor. I just want to share with you that the people of the District of Columbia are grateful for you being here. While Washington, D.C. is the seat of the nation's federal government, it's more than just a place underpinned by politics. It's a town with neighborhoods, people raising their families, and running small businesses. We've been in business for um, about seven years now. A mere mile down the road from all the National Guard at the U.S. Capitol sits the Capitol candy jar. We make a lot of uh, red, white, and blue candy. Even with candy in D.C., politics are never too far away. But for Dave Burton, running his small business here is like running one anywhere else in America, just trying to survive in a pandemic. Yeah, most years uh, we do a huge inauguration business, and most of that is uh, through hotels that are looking to give some sort of amenity to the people that are staying in them. But um, our hotel business, because of the pandemic, disappeared back in March, and most of those hotels haven't come back. For the safety of his employees, the store will close on Inauguration Day. For those who live here, the city is more than just the sum of any troubles or celebrations. Part of the reason I live in this town is because I love this city. Um, I just, I still get goosebumps when I drive up 395 and I come around the corner, I see the Washington Monument. I love taking picnics on the National Mall. There are a million things I love about this city. A city that's home to some of our nation's best known monuments and to many more, simply home. In Washington, I'm Maya Rodriguez. Com. I think amongst everything, it's just very grateful, you know, um, you know, for such support I've received from not only the Pacers players, but the front office and, um, you know, the fans. New Pacer Karis Levert says he's looking forward to getting on the court, but there is no timetable yet. Today, Levert spoke as a Pacer for the first time since being traded to the team as part of the deal that sent Victor Oladipo to Houston. It's also the first time he's talked publicly about the physical that revealed a mass in his kidney. It's standard for players to take physicals before trades are finalized. The health issue may not have been discovered for months otherwise. I didn't have any symptoms. Obviously, as you all know, I was playing in games. I hadn't missed any games this season yet. I was feeling 100% healthy. So um, <clears throat> in a way, this, this trade definitely um, 
you know, showed and revealed, you know, what was going on in my body. So I'm definitely looking at it, you know, from that side and definitely humbled to know that, you know, this trade could have possibly, um, you know, saved me in the long, in the long run. LeVar says he does not know if the mask could be cancerous. More diagnosis details are expected in the next week or so. And the Pacers are back in action tomorrow night, but there was plenty of hoops action on this Tuesday evening. Brad Brown has a recap of Butler and Purdue both on the road. Butler was looking to keep the momentum from last weekend's win over number eight Creighton. A fast start put this game away early in favor of the Bulldogs. Jair Bolton outscored DePaul by himself over the first 10 minutes. He scored a quick 11 and Butler led 20 to 10 midway through the first half. BU's freshman duo each scored in double figures again tonight. Chuck Harris and Miles Tate continue to thrive as Butler's been working with a short roster due to injuries. Each scored 10 points in the game. Butler's lead was eight at the break, got as high as 25 early in the second. Things got a bit chippy between the teams with seven minutes to go as the Blue Devils tried to make a comeback. DePaul would get within a dozen, but the dogs were able to put the game away down the stretch. Bryce Golden gets one inside, part of a 10-point night. Bolden led the scoring with 21. 67-53 when it was done, the first road win of the season for Butler. It's a confidence builder. I know the match for guys, but it's more about how we play. Um, I think that's the, the big key that uh, we're really focused on and guys were really locked in on is, is having the, as David said, the right energy um, and the right approach. And that should yield the results if you, if you can sustain it. Like I said, we lost our, lost our cool there for a second uh, and then we were able to, to snap back late. The Bulldogs are home on Friday night when they face Seton Hall. Purdue playing at Ohio State. The Boilers trailed for 19 of the 20 minutes in the second half. They were down five with two minutes to go. Trevion Williams making it happen again. He had 16 points and seven rebounds. That bucket got it down to a three-point margin. Purdue was just three of 18 from three-point range until the final minute. Sasha Stefanovic knocks one down. That tied the game at 64 all. He scored 15. The biggest shot of the night came from the freshman, Jaden Ivey. He had a couple of big ones late at IU last week. And with five seconds left, Purdue's first lead since early. That one turned out to be the winner. I've been struggling, you know, mentally. Just trying to gather myself. And I know I, I want to win, and I want to win so bad. And just to see that shot go win, it just means everything. Ivy scored 15. The last three were the biggest. Purdue comes away with a crucial road win against the 15th ranked Buckeyes. Boilers improved to 7 and 3 in the Big Ten. They're home against Michigan on Friday. The plans are coming together for Indy's March Madness Extravaganza. The NCAA announcing game dates on Tuesday. The first four will go March 18th, two games each at IU and Purdue. The first round will start the following day on March 19th. The Sweet 16 games will be played at Bankers Life Fieldhouse and Hinkle Fieldhouse as a Saturday-Sunday quadruple header on the 27th and 28th. The Elite Eight and Final Four games will all be at Lucas Oil Stadium. Selection Sunday starts it all off on March 14th. Brad Brown, WRTV Sports. Cold and dry to start your Wednesday morning. The snow showers will be off to the east. Our temperatures by noon at 27. Only 32 for the high tomorrow, Mark, but...